That's right, here we are once again. It's the physics video lecture. Physics 203 video lecture five. And where were we last time? Lagrangian mechanics, Lagrangians, coordinate systems. So I want to take it through symmetries and conservation laws today. This is a good place to do that because we're in a theoretical vein right now, uh, general aspects, and after we do that, we'll dive into some actual systems and solutions. But you could say this is the theme of what can you say about a system without actually solving the equations of motion? So what can you say in general? And it's more than you might think. Good. So the whole, the title of this entire thing is Symmetries and Conservation Laws. We have to build up to it for, for a bit. And we had already seen the conservation laws, and so Lagrangian mechanics casts a different light on them, and it's very interesting. Good, so we'll begin with some Lagrangians. We have, in fact, I'll just put up the whole formalism now. Q1 to QN dot QN dot P D T with a very we have a variational principle and that gives us the Euler Lagrange equations. And of course this is kinetic minus potential energy. These are generalized coordinates. Of course they include the Cartesian coordinates and some other systems that we're aware of, and we can, we've can we seen we can also mix the coordinates up. So yeah, we have this, then we have the Euler-Lagrange equations. So Q sub i, i equals one to n, it's always n, whatever. And we also have this Euler second form, partial, no, not F, partial L, they're L's now, partial L, partial Q, I dot, Q, I dot, minus L outside of the sum, is equal to the constant energy, which is constant. And here the condition was, if L, is not explicitly a function of the time. Okay. And we have energy conserved. And this can be, but is not always just P plus U. That is to say, there are Lagrangians that don't have the simple form kinetic plus potential energy. And in that case, if you want to get this conserved quantity, you have to go back to this expression. Okay. This is the fundamental one. Good, so there's our Lagrangian mechanics. That's a variational principle, got these equations, got this thing here. So what I want to next talk about is cyclic coordinates. Um, actually, let's do this. So some example Lagrangians. These will help me make my point. So, first of all, for projectile motion, right, we always have to be able to do our real basics. Projectile motion, say in X, Y, and Z, we would have um, right, L equals. So our Lagrangian would be a half M X dot Y dot squared plus Z dot squared kinetic minus mgc. So there we have x, y, z, and z is the up direction. Okay. So that would be the Lagrangian for projectile motion. The Lagrangian for the central force. And this one takes a few steps to get to. We're going to do a thorough discussion of the central force problem later on. Um, but you've seen this before. 
Namely, if you're in plane polar coordinates, you'd have r squared plus no, r dot squared, r squared d dot squared minus u of r. That gives you your central force Lagrangian for a point particle in a central potential. Or a reduced two-body problem where this is the reduced mass. Okay, so those are some examples of Lagrangians. And here's Cartesian, here's plane polar coordinates. So now I'm going to define what's called a cyclic coordinate. Cyclic or ignorable. Cyclic coordinate is a coordinate that is not explicitly present in the Lagrangian. So cyclic coordinate not explicit. Well, how can that be? How can the cyclic coordinate not be explicitly present? Well, these two examples show this Lagrangian here you want to do a different color. Here we have L equals L of X, Y, Z, X dot, Y dot, Z dot. And here we have L equals L of R, B, R dot, Z dot. But what's not explicitly present in this first one is uh, X and Y. Both of these are not explicitly present Right? It's a problem that involves three space, but only Z is explicitly present in the Lagrangian. Likewise, down here, we're in plane polar coordinates, so we're in two space, but what do we have here? We don't have an explicit phi. We have R dot, phi dot, and R, but not phi. Here we have X dot, Y dot, Z dot, and Z, but not X and Y. So I'll just circle these in blue. These are our cyclic coordinates. In our examples one, we have x, y are cyclic, and in example two, p is a cyclic coordinate. Okay, now I'm going to state this general theorem, we'll call it, just to, just to use the word theorem every now and then. So, theorem, if Q sub J is cyclic, then P sub J equals DL DQ sub J dot is conserved. Okay. If Q sub J is cyclic, then P sub J, and what we then call this is, this is the generalized coordinate, and this is the generalized momentum. Generalized coordinate, generalized momentum. Generalized coordinate, generalized momentum. Okay. And proof, let L equal L of Q2 to Qn. No loss of generality, we're going to have Q1 be our cyclic coordinate. Q2 to Qn. Q1 dot to Qn dot. You notice what I did here? I started with the 2. So L is not explicitly a function of Q sub 1. That's the way I designate that. Now what we have is our Euler-Lagrange equation. D, 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 L, D, Q sub 1 dot minus D, L, Q sub 1 is equal to 0. We have no explicit Q sub 1. Therefore, this is 0. 
Now we have a complete time derivative of dl dq1 dot equal to zero, and that proves dl dq1 dot equals constant. And this was, of course, without loss of generality, so it holds for any of those q's. So the cyclic coordinate, if you have a cyclic coordinate, you immediately have a conserved quantity. That is to say, in Lagrangian mechanics, you can just by inspection see what your conserved quantities are. For example, up here, x and y are cyclic. Piece of x and piece of y are conserved. Okay. And phi is cyclic, so p sub phi is conserved. We immediately see that. I'll go ahead and write that down. In our examples, one, we have p sub x equals dl dx dot mx dot. That's conserved. And, you know, we remember that from projectile motion, that the horizontal motion is constant velocity, therefore also constant linear momentum. And it's the vertical motion that, you know, is, is accelerated. So, equals constant. And ditto p sub y, dl dy dot and y dot is constant. So yeah, it's just staring us in the face. Now for equation, for example two, we have p sub phi is conserved, dl d phi dot. And what is that? dl d phi dot, we're going to have m r squared phi dot, if you look up there, okay? dl d phi dot. 2 cancels 1 half there, m r squared phi dot, m r squared phi dot equals constant. And yeah, what is that? That's the magnitude of the angular momentum. So the generalized momentum when you have an angle coordinate is the angular momentum. So let's go ahead and write that down. the conserved angular momentum magnitude. And uh, I'll remind you how that works there. You've got, uh, you've got R, you've got M, and you say so you're sweeping through along some trajectory. Then R phi dot So yeah, let's write this down. So how does this turn into a, a mass times a velocity? A, a, I'm sorry, a, a momentum times a length, which is an angular momentum. A momentum times a length. So we would have we would have r times m r p dot. Right. So this would be that that speed. Mass, linear momentum, r length. Okay. So yeah, that's the angular momentum. Good. So very important. You've got these cyclic coordinates. You can immediately see what a conservation law is. Now the next thing is, you go back to this idea of symmetry conservation law, the cyclic coordinate expresses a symmetry in the problem. So again, this uh, projectile motion example is just the best one to start with. You know, the tabletop now, this is the infinite plane. Okay, the infinite plane, and here's my z-axis. Okay, the physics is completely the same if I place the origin over here. This, this xy plane, um, the, the infinite plane, so there's a symmetry there. If I move the origin somewhere else, 
everything still looks exactly the same. That's what we're talking about in symmetry. We can do this translation, nothing changes, and that's reflected in the fact that x and y are not explicitly present. Now, if we're talking about a symmetry, again, so symmetries and conservation laws, we're talking about the central force cycling coordinate, phi. Now we're in the infinite plane and we're looking at the center of potential. Maybe there's a light bulb there or something. Okay, we're looking at that. And if we swing around the, the angle but keep the distance from that object, everything looks the same. So no matter where I am, if I'm the same distance from it, say one meter, then in the absence of any other uh, references, everything looks exactly the same. Okay. So that's the idea of the symmetry. And we see the cyclic coordinate expresses the fact that there is a symmetry, and that symmetry or in this case, cyclic coordinate gives us the conservation law. So we're going to extend that idea a little bit and just take the basic symmetries of space and time and show how we get the conservation laws from them in the Lagrangian mechanics. Without the explicit case, we're going to do this in general now. So that's our symmetries and conservation laws discussion. The cyclic coordinates are really important. It turns out that the only way to solve problems in physics and mechanics, or you know, one of the best ways, is to be able to find a cyclic coordinate. Um, and if you don't have one, you often can't solve the problem. So you have to investigate the problem and find the most convenient coordinate system. I could give that example later or now. I think I'll actually give it now, and then we'll do the formal discussion. So yeah, since we uh, since we're discussing uh, these Lagrangians here, yeah. So we're going to stick with the central force problem, um, and that will illustrate what we're talking about. So once again, the central force. Central force Lagrangian. Um, L equals P minus U. Suppose all we know is that it was the central force and we want to try Cartesian coordinates. Cartesian coordinates, then fine. We have a single point mass m x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared. And uh, let's just say Newton. We're talking about Newton's law. Because then we know that the potential would be minus some constant over r, right? But r is what? It's root x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Well, the symmetry is not really visible here. This is a legitimate Lagrangian. Okay. Everything's independent. X, Y, and Z are independent coordinates. One point you know, with respect to an origin. But you're not seeing the symmetry here, and you would never be able to solve this. Even if you knew you had, if you had motion in the plane, okay? you already know you have motion in the plane, say, okay, I'll restrict it to motion in the plane, you're still not seeing that symmetry. Okay. So, symmetry is not apparent. If you realize that you can go to plane polar coordinates, so these are both Cartesian, if you go to plane polar, and that's a legitimate transformation, 
this last one here, now you can see, okay, I've got a cyclic coordinate. Okay, my Euler Lagrange equations, I'll be able to solve them. If you were to write them out for this, they just would be very difficult coupled equations. Okay, so it, it's always done this way and that's why. But this one actually expresses the symmetry that we're talking about, namely with respect to that angle phi. Uh, so a couple of words to put with this. Um, symmetry not apparent. Here we see the symmetry with respect to the angle. Okay. Both of these are not apparent. Okay, it's good. So now we'll go to the symmetries of conservation laws. You may want to add some. You may want to add some words to this on what a bad idea it would be to try it along these lines. In fact, you know, if you have nothing better to do, write out the Euler-Lagrange equations for this. Don't bother with the spherical polar, right? But you can try to write them out for here and see what's going on, see that you're stuck. Okay. If you write them out this way, then your your conservation of angular momentum and your Conservation of energy will lead you right on the right path. Okay, so let's see how we're doing time-wise here. We don't have to get it all done today, but uh, it's a great topic. So symmetries and conservation laws. Let's have a go. Well, we already have the conservation of energy, so I just have to say a word about uh, that symmetry. And in fact, I'll write all of them down and take them one by one. So, symmetries of space and time. And time. And our first one Actually, all of these, we have to have a preface to this. Inertial system. We have to be in an inertial system for these symmetries to be manifest. So time, in an inertial system, time is homogeneous. That means one moment in time is exactly as good as the next. If you're driving in a car on a bumpy and curvy road, then each moment is different, right? If you do an experiment here, it's going to be different than you do it there. But in an inertial system, time is homogeneous, the same everywhere. And what this means is that for an isolated system, the Lagrangian will not depend explicitly on time. So, isolated system L is not explicitly a function of time, that's my, that's my shorthand for that phrase. And because of that, this Euler second form comes into play, qi dot minus L t minus mu equals d is constant. So the conservation of energy, conservation of energy follows from the homogeneity of time. Okay, so time is homogeneous implies energy is conserved. So that's the first one. And, you know, time is sort of a cyclic coordinate, although it's not really a coordinate, it doesn't play a role of coordinate in the dynamics, but at least not in classical, uh, you know, non-relativistic. But still, it, it's, it's a sort of cyclic coordinate and the conservation law that goes with that is energy. The next conservation law comes from the fact that space is homogeneous. Space is homogeneous, 
what that means is that one point in space is just as good as another point in space. Now, if you were in a non-inertial system, for example, on a turntable that's rotating, then it's clearly not the case. Okay. If you're in an inertial system, then one point is, the adequate, is equivalent to the next. Okay. So space is homogeneous, and now we want to see what does that imply? Okay, what we're going to um, draw from that is that an infinitesimal translation should leave the Lagrangian unchanged because it should leave the physics unchanged. An infinitesimal translation of the entire mechanical system or of the entire coordinate system should leave the Lagrangian unchanged. Unchanged, okay. So infinitesimal translation leaves the Lagrangian unchanged. We're requiring that now. Um, in our projectile motion one, it was explicitly the fact. But now we're just going to say we have a general Lagrangian. We're going to require that this infinitesimal translation leaves Lagrangian unchanged. So the infinitesimal translation, we'll just name it epsilon, gets applied to every element of the mechanical system. So we're going to be in Cartesian coordinates now. And we'll let, let um, R sub i go to R sub i plus epsilon. For all the i, you know, all the, all the particles, Translation by the same little vector, or dr is equal to epsilon. Now r sub i dot is transformed just to r sub i dot because epsilon is a constant. Um, and therefore, dr sub i dot is equal to zero. Now here's what we do. We construct the Lagrangian in terms of that epsilon. It's the original Lagrangian plus, um, actually let me just write down, since we're in Cartesian coordinates, we're looking at this. L is equal to L r1 to rn r1 dot. That's our standard Cartesian coordinate Lagrangian, no explicit time, okay, point system. Okay. So now I'm going to take this L sub epsilon, and it's basically an expansion of this to first order. So it's L plus, you can say it's DL, it's L plus sum over I DL the r sub i, the r sub i, plus sum over, this is just big chain rule, uh, into the r sub i dot. Right. That's just the expansion of the Lagrangian in terms of this transformation. But we're requiring, did I write it down? Yes, that the Lagrangian remains unchanged. So this first order change in the Lagrangian, we're going to require that it vanish based on the fact that this infinitesimal translation leaves the physics unchanged, which is the symmetry there, symmetry principle. So because of that, because we're calling this zero here, we already had this was zero, and this thing here is epsilon, 
dr is equal to epsilon. So now uh, I've got more room over here. So now sum of d l d r what about the r sub i dotted into epsilon equals zero. I equals one to n. I'm going to do two things. Epsilon is common to the entire system, so I can pull it outside of the sum. It's an arbitrary infinitesimal vector. And here, I can use the other half of the Euler-Lagrange equation. Okay. So this is d over dt partial l partial r sub i dot is equal to zero. Now, I'm going to argue that because this is completely arbitrary, it's like the uh, fundamental lemma, because this is arbitrary, what it's multiplying has to vanish. Okay. So because epsilon is arbitrary, this entire sum has to vanish, and I can pull the complete time derivative out of the sum. So epsilon arbitrary, therefore, two steps at once here, time derivative of this thing here is equal to zero, but that is p sub i equal to zero. That means capital P, all right, total, sum of the individual linear momenta is constant. Okay. So we said this translation has to leave the Lagrangian unchanged because that's to leave the physics unchanged. So this little first order expansion change has to vanish. This one vanished. Then this sum here has to vanish, which is that substitute it with the Euler-Lagrange equation, complete time derivative. So that's conservation of linear momentum. Space is homogeneous implies total linear momentum is conserved. Okay. So that's that conservation law. Let's, uh, just for the record, see that, you have to choose the right coordinate system. You know, we could turn that old argument around. So the projectile motion in Cartesian coordinates, you can just see the conservation law. But how about if you express projectile motion Lagrangian in terms of plane polar coordinates? You wouldn't see it. That would be a very poor choice of coordinate system. Okay, good. So we have space is homogeneous. Therefore, translation leaves system unchanged. Therefore, linear momentum is conserved. So we have the last, you know, I'll put it here on this list and then erase that form. So the third one is space is isotropic. Isotropic means that the direction that you point your experiment in over here or there or there leaves the result of the experiment unchanged. For an isolated system in an inertial system, inertial reference frame. So space is isotropic. 
And what does that mean? An infinitesimal rotation should leave the physics unchanged. Rotation, say of the entire coordinate system, infinitesimal rotation leaves L unchanged. Right? Lagrangian is unchanged, the equations are the same, and then you have the same physics. So now we have to deal with the infinitesimal rotation. This one's interesting. This one, it's going to be a similar construction to what we just did, but a little bit more going on. So how do we construct an infinitesimal rotation mathematically? So it's infinitesimal rotation Imagine this, we have a point in space, there's our vector r sub i, and we do a cross product with a d phi vector. A cross product with this d phi vector rotates the whole thing in a different color, you know. It's, it's kind of doing that, the way when you spin it. Bad drawing once more. If it were a full rotation, but you know, this would be an omega type of vector that we've seen before, and that's what I wanted. Okay. So we, the cross product of this sends this thing into the board, and it's an omega of, of rotation. So there's a infinitesimal rotation, infinitesimal rotation d phi, and so what we now have is um, dr is equal to d phi cross r, dr sub i, that's that little dr right here, and our dr sub i dot is when basically we're applying the infinitesimal rotation to the velocity vector, so that's equal to d phi cross r sub i dot, velocity and position. So now the same thing with that we had with Lagrangian before. We start with L r sub 1 r sub dot, r sub n dot. We start with that Lagrangian, and then we're going to do the first order expansion. So L sub phi is equal to L plus sum over dL dr sub i. That's just the differential plus sum over dL dr sub i dot dr sub i dot. And the same argument as before. This equals zero because of our symmetry. We require that that be zero. And that means that this infinitesimal rotation leaves L unchanged. Okay, so we put that down in words. This time we have to replace these drs with a little more involved expression. So now what we're saying is partial L with respect to R sub i dotted into this d phi cross dr. d phi cross, not cross dr, d phi cross R sub i. This is d phi cross R sub i. And then same thing, dl dr sub i dot, dotted into this 
parentheses here. C B cross R I dot. So yeah, these two sums all added up have to go to zero. Kind of send us up for a little room. So this needs a little intermediate reminder. So we need that vector identity that we use for the volume of the parallelopiped. And I'll just remind us how that transforms cyclically. So recall A dot B cross C. You can cyclically right, bring this one to the front the other two in C dot A cross B one more time B dot C cross A so B dot C cross A because what we're trying to do is bring this BP out front the way we did before so now we would have um, B, B dot R sub I cross B L B R sub I. And on the second one we would have B P dot R sub I dot cross B L B R sub I dot. So these two sums been transformed a little, they add up to zero, and I'm going to do a couple steps at the same time again. The DP comes out because it's common to all of them, doesn't have a subscript. And then what do I have left? I have these two sums, but I'm just going to write it out because what we have here. Um, R Okay, I'm not going to skip the step. So we have R sub I cross D over D P D L D R sub I dot. This is from the Euler Lagrange equation. Here we have sum over R sub I dot cross BL R sub I dot. And there's a product rule here. And the complete time derivative can be pulled out as well. So now we're going to have B B dot D over D P sum. R sub I cross D P P. No, I R sub I cross P sub I. Equals zero. There is a product rule here. Time derivative either gives me the P sub I dot or the R sub I dot. So there's a product rule that gives me what's up here, and I've substituted dl dr i dot for p sub i to generalize the memory. And now you can see what's going to happen again. Arbitrary so that's arbitrary, therefore this thing vanishes. Complete time derivative of this equal to zero. So the sum of the individual angular momenta vanishes. Okay. So therefore this is equal to constant. So yeah, the upshot of this is conservation of total angular momentum of the system. Total 
angular momentum. So what do we have here? P, 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 I'm going to use L as a vector, L no would run into an angular momentum is equal to zero. That means L equals the sum of R sub I cross P sub I is constant. Observation angular momentum. So there you have it. those follow from those symmetries and this uh, Argument here is, is pretty interesting how we required that small change to vanish. Because we, again, we required the Lagrangian to remain unchanged. So this change in the Lagrangian had to vanish. And it was based on what symmetry we applied. We found these conservation laws. So there we have it. energy, linear momentum, angular momentum are conserved. Let's check the time once again. I have one more topic that I'll do to wrap up this whole thing. The theme is what can you know about a system without actually solving the equation of motion? And uh, we've seen we can get these conservation laws. And if we write the Lagrangian down in the correct form or in the advantageous form, then the conservation laws will just fall into our lap, so to speak. We'll just see them and write them down. So let me give an example of that. Landau and Lipschitz has a whole list of these. I think Goldstein does it too. <clears throat> Suppose we had a gravitating object. Um, Let's call this a gravitating dumbbell. So here's our gravitating object. It's some giant cosmic space station. Okay? And we're attracted to it by gravity because it's so big. And it's a dumbbell here. So there's a sphere here. And there's a cylinder here. And there's a sphere down there that's symmetric. So this is the X, Y, and Z. Yeah, we're flying around this thing. What, uh, what's conserved? What's the conservation law? Yeah, in X, Y, and Z, you're not going to find the conservation law. So what we want to do is construct L with the right coordinate system. And first of all, we see we have a kind of a cylindrical type of symmetry. L of, so we could say rho B Z, rho dot B dot Z dot. And this is going to be the potential energy, right? Potential energy is going to explicitly depend on rho B and Z. But in this case, um, so actually let's write this down here. So we have 1 half m rho dot squared, rho squared, z dot squared, plus z dot squared. So we're using cylindrical coordinates. But what about the potential energy? That's a gravitating object right there. So what can you depend on? Can it depend on this distance from here, rho? It cannot, because as you come closer to it, it looms in your field of vision. You get further away from it. It's smaller. So that's no symmetry. Z, not, nor can it uh, be in terms of Z here. 
because it's also going to change its aspect in z. But only phi is a cyclic coordinate here. So u can only be, um, or u has to be a function of rho and z, but not phi, and therefore you're going to just have that angular momentum conservation. You wouldn't see it if you were doing x, y, and z. So there's a lot of other types of examples of this type that you can come up with. And you write down what your Lagrangian would have to be, and then you see what your conservation laws are. OK. OK, so we have that. One more, one more short. You know what, I'll put that up for next time. So next, gauge transformation. There's a short proof for it, but if we save it for next time, we can do a little more with it. See how much time we're doing here. I think we're good for the day. So next time we'll do the gauge transformation also allows us to uh, apply a transformation to a Lagrangian and leave the equations of motion unchanged, which is the theme. Okay, good. See you guys next time.